All right, guys. So today I'm going to talk about Road to 250 about thyroid physiology. I know we have definitely touched on uh, thyroid hormone mechanism and drugs associated. I'm just going to do a little bit of review with that and then a little bit more. All righty. So to start off with, the first two slides are going to be purely um, going based off of review from what Yash presented a couple, well, several weeks ago at this point. But just a reminder. So as we know, iodide is brought into the follicle with a sodium through the sodium iodide symporter. And within the follicle cell, then the thyroglobulin is synthesized from tyrosine um, and secretory vesicles export the thyroglobulin into the lumen or into the blood side. And then within the lumen, the iodine and thyroglobulin are combined via the enzyme peroxidase to form monoiodotyrosine, which is MIT, and uh, diiodotyrosine, DIT. And then if we put two DIT molecules together, that makes thyroxine, also known as T4. And if we do one DIT molecule and one MIT molecule, that makes um, triiodotyrosine, which is T3. Um, and then uh, the second review would just be the export and peripheral activation. So when the thyroid follicle is stimulated by TSH, um, where is our TSH um, secreted from? Hypothalamus. Yeah, exactly. So uh, when our hypothalamus is stimulated, uh, the thyroid follicle uh, is stimulated by TSH, and molecules of T4 and T3 will be brought from the lumen inside that follicle into the cell body by endocytosis. So that's what's calling for T4 and T3 to be released. As we know, T4 is the more abundant in the serum than T3, but T3 is more potent. So when T4 enters a cell in the peripheral tissues, it will be converted to T3 by 5' prime iodinase. And then T4 can also be converted to reverse T3, R T3, which is the inactive form. Um, and this mechanism is utilized in states of of excess of T4. So when we have a lot of T4, it's going to be reversed into the RT3 or the inactive form. And I know that last time we uh, brought up um, how the structure of the molecule is just a stoichiometry concept in which um, it's in a different position um, and how that's how it's considered inactive. Uh, T3 is the more abundant and is converted into T3 peripherally, which is more active. And um, again, T4 is also converted into T reverse T3 peripherally, which is inactive. Uh, and then T3 acts on intracellular uh, sorry, receptor, which has uh, actions on the nucleus. And T4 is transferred through the placenta. A fetus with thyroid dysgenesis can have normal thyroid levels. Um, do you guys want to tell me a pathology that can arise in a newborn um, if the mother is hyper or hypothyroidism? Has creatinism? Yeah, exactly, creatinism. And do you guys remember any of those um, symptoms or features that they present with? Um, these babies have like a protuberant tummy, um, pot belly, um, the puff kind face. of yeah, puff face or like a gargoyle face. So, yeah, yeah. a protuberant tongue, and they have a poor brain development. Yes. And sorry, one other thing: TSH is from the anterior pituitary. TRH is from the hypothalamus. Sorry, I said that wrong. Yeah, releasing hormone and then stimulating hormone. Yes. Yep. So the releasings are from the hypothalamus. The stimulating is from like the anterior pituitary in the case of thyroid hormone. All right. So a question. Um, yeah. 
If a female patient with a history of psychiatric illness is abusing level thyroxine to lose weight, uh, given her excess ingestion of T4, what would happen to the levels of T3, T4, TSH, and reverse T3? So, um, so she's taking level thyroxine, and if you uh, remember, the thyroxine is which um, thy thyroid hormone? Which one's known as thyroxine? T4. Yeah, exactly. So we have a exogenous T4. Um, so then from there, maybe that can help you guys tell me what the levels TSH of the will be low, T4 will be high. Okay, yeah, so we said that. Uh, okay, what about T3? Um, low. No. Yeah, that's right, because like you said, uh, okay, it's a lot out of order, sorry. So T4, um, well, okay, yeah, so you have an exogenous in coming, so the feedback would then um, decrease TSH, and so then there's not going to be any T3 production and T4 production. However, because there's an exogenous intake of T4, the T4 will be high. Um, and like you said, TSH, um, since there's an exogenous coming in, it's going to be decreased. It's not going to be needing more uh, to be output. And then the reverse T3, we said that excess T4 would be uh, converted into RT3 or inactive. So what would be the level in this case? High. Right, exactly, because we have a lot of T4. Um, so does that make sense? Sorry, it was a little out of order, but... Yeah, the way you remember RT3 is that the levels of RT3 are T3. similar to T4. Exactly. Right. Very good. Um, yep, you can kind of use that rule that whatever T4 is looking like is what's going to be RT3. And then don't forget that, though, yes, the T4 level would be decreased um, by feedback. Since we are in taking an exogenous form of T3, it would be increased. All right. So moving forward, uh, thyroid binding globulin. So the liver synthesizes TGB, which binds to um, T3 and T4. Only the free T3 and T4 not bound, are not, sorry, only the free T3 and T4 uh, is what TG, TBG will bind to. Um, and those are also considered the ones um, that are active. Okay, so let me reword this. So TGB, TBG is going to bind to T3 and T4, and um, whatever that this binding globulin uh, does not bind to uh, will be considered the free T3 and T4, and they are considered the active. Uh, and I'll explain that in a more visual format in just a moment. Oh, gosh. Uh, okay, so other important... Um, facts to note, is that estrogen increases the TBG synthesis. So increasing the binding of T3 and T4, since there's more, um, so since there's more globulin available, there's going to be more binding of T3 and T4. And uh, therefore, there's going to be a decrease in how much is unbound, or also known as the free T3, T4. So transit increase. TSH will stimulate the release of T3 and T4, like we know, by, by uh, regular um, regulation from the thyroid. And the net result is going to be that normal uh, free T3 and T4 will be increased total T3 and T4. The total T3 and T4 is going to be considered what is bound and then what is free, but the value put together. And again, I know that sounds really confusing, but I'll ex try to explain it in a more visual format. So in the case of pregnancy and oral contraceptive pills, um, this can increase the levels of thyroid binding globulin due to increased levels of estrogen. So estrogen increases how much thyroid binding globulin is made from the liver. And so 
um, this would result down the road. And then one last point is that thyroid bind binding globulin synthesis is decreased in liver dysfunction. So if the liver is um, damaged, then the synthesis is going to be also decreased. However, um, if we have increased free T3 and T4 in the periphery, uh, then um, that's going to be increased thy thyroid hormone available. So it's going to be considered hyperthyroid. And uh, there's going to be decreased TSH to compensate since we already have more than enough T3 and T4 needed. So it's going to uh, negative feedback on TSH and say we don't need any more. So the net result of the normal free T3 and T4 is decreased, but the total, which is considered the bound plus the free, is going to be, sorry, um, the T3 and T4, for free levels are going to be normal, but the total will be decreased. Um, okay, so let me just like kind of try to explain that a little bit better. Okay, so we have our liver and it outputs. Sorry. And here in the periphery, we have. One, two, three. Okay. So, um, so like I said, the thyroid binding globulin will bind to the available T3, T4. And so when it does, This will be considered the bound form. And what is left over in the periphery is going to be considered the free. Um, and the free is also the active. Uh, the binded is going to be considered kind of like a stored form. And so now, so if we uh, considered the estrogen scenario, estrogen is going to increase the amount of binding globul globulin available. And so it's going to form a lot of bound um, T3, T4, leaving very little uh, free T3, T4 molecules available since we have increased globulin. And so as a result, um, if our body senses that there's decreased T3, T4 available in the periphery, then it's going to uh, stimulate um, the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary to release more T3 and T4 to normalize it. So we're currently in the state of increased estrogen and increased binding globulin we become in a state where there's not enough T3, T4 available. And so um, our uh, anterior pituitary um, stimulates TSH to release more T3 and T4. And at that point, we become normal levels of T3 and T4. So at the end then, um, the free T3 and T4 levels will be normal, but there will be an increase in the total, because total is going to be how much there's free plus how much there's bound. We already said that the T3 and T4 free has normalized, so it's normal, um, but we still have increased TBG and therefore how much is bound. So that will be a plus. So like I, I guess if we took the, to if we wanted to put it so somewhat in like an equation, the total would be how much is bound plus free. And we already said that free has normalized to a normal level. So it's going to be a normal plus increase, which will be an overall increase in the total. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if I put in a question format, we have a patient 
with liver failure and they have low levels of thyroid binding globulin. What would happen to the total thyroid and free T3, T4 levels? Um, okay, so I guess I'll start you guys off. So as we know, liver failure would mean now that the amount of synthesized thyroid binding globulin is decreased. So now what would happen? There'll be more free T3, T4. Exactly. It's going to be increased. And if we have a lot, then our um, hypothalamus access will do what? TSH will decrease. So there'll be a less total T4. Yeah, so um, there's not going to be any more stimulation or release of T3 and T4. And it's going to decrease the amount. So then it will normalize um, how much we need, how much T3 and T4 levels we need. So then what would be the total? Decrease. Exactly, because we have our body normalized what our T3, T4 levels should be, plus how much is bound. Well, we already have decreased, so there's not much bound at all. Um, and so overall, there's going to be a decrease because it's like a negative plus a plus minus, I guess. <laughs> Is that making sense? Mm -hmm. If anybody has a better way of explaining it, please do, or if um, it makes better sense to you in a different way, feel free to sh shout it out. Okay. Um, all right. So if we have a pregnant patient, um, they have normal physiologic elevated estrogen, and this increase in estrogen can increase the amount of thyroid bind binding globulin. So what would be the increase, uh, what would the increase um, thyroid binding globulin do to the free and the total T3, T4? Decrease the free. Yep, it's initially decrease, but then what does our normal body function do to it? So if our body mm -hmm. senses there's low T3, T4, then the hypothalamus will increase total. Yep, so then it's gonna normalize the levels of T3 and T4. Um, but then what would our total be at the end of the day? Increased. Yep, because we have increased thyroid binding globulin because we have increased estrogen. And then we have this as normal. So then plus minus, um, whatever, plus minus is increased. All right. Um, there are two tests that I wanted to kind of briefly talk about. The first one is triiodothyronine resin uptake test. So this, this is used to measure the amount of T3 that's bound to thyroid binding globulin. And the steps are, uh, so the patient serum is drawn and then radioactive T3 is added to the serum. A resin is added and this resin quantifies the amount of radioactive T3. So endogenous uh, thyroid binding globulin is a determining factor of how much radioactive T3 binds with resin. So the radioactive iodine binds to either the thyroid binding globulin or resin. So if there are more binding sites available on thyroid binding globulin, such as in the example of a hypothyroidism because we have less T3, T4 to begin with, um, then the radioactive iodine will uh, saturate the available binding sites um, on that thyroid binding globulin. And it's going to result in less T3 bound to the resin. So uh, overall, it's just kind of helping us to, it's like a diagnostic feature. Um, does that make sense? Or any, let's see if I can ask a question. So if we had a patient who was hyperthyroid, then what would be the level of radioactive T3 bound to resin? Sorry, could you ask that again? Yeah. So if there, if there, if you had, if we were determining or doing a diagnostic 
test on a patient who had hyperthyroidism, Mm -hmm. what would happen to the level of radioactive T3 bound to resin? Would it be decreased? Um, No. Because if we have a patient who is hyperthyroid, then they have increased T3, T4, right? Hence, that means how much is bound to thyroid binding globulin is going to be much more. And so that leaves the radioactive that's been injected, it leaves it no other place but for it to be bound to resin. So it's going to be increase. There's going to be more bound to resin. Does that make sense? So like here in a patient who's hypothyroid, there's less T3, T4 meaning that the amount that's bound is going to be less since there's less in the periphery. And because there's less, uh, the radioactive is going to prefer to bind to the thyroid binding globulin sites. And so then there's not going to be anything left for it to bind to resin. And that's in the case of hypothyroid. But my question for hyperthyroid, where there's lots of T3 and T4, most likely all the sites available at on thyroid binding globulin is going to be already saturated, meaning there's more um, of that radioactive amount that was added to bind to resin now. So there's going to be an increased binding. Does that make sense? Gotcha. All right. Okay, so the radioactive um, a, a radioactive iodine uptake test. So this is uh, measuring how much iodine is absorbed by the thyroid gland per unit time. Uh, the uptake of iodine should be proportional to the activity of the TSH receptor activity. So high levels of TSH would be expecting uh, with high uptake of iodine. So... If, um, and the way that the vignettes kind of word this is uh, the radioactive um, or the iodine, uh, if it lights up um, or if there's fluorescent scene, then it's considered a hot nodule because there's high TSH activity. And high TSH activity means more T3, T4, which means we have a case of hyperthyroidism, which could lead us to any of the pathologies, um, but more specifically something like graves. Versus if there's not much fluorescent seen or there's not, no light, then it's a cold nodule. And that would mean that there's low TSH activities and hence um, low T3, T4, so hypothyroid. And that could lead us to a diagnosis or pathology of Hashimoto's. Okay, and last but not least, actions of thyroid hormone. So overall, it acts to upregulate the actions of many organs and processes. For example, bone growth. Uh, T3 and T4 have a synergistic effect on bone growth with growth hormone, and this is an example of permissive effect. Uh, It also aids in central nervous system development. Um, It also regulates metabolisms by, or specifically the mechanism is that uh, we have a, uh, so increased um, levels of thyroid hormone would result in increased sodium potassium ATPase activity, which would um, increase the oxygen consumption, which is required to make ATP. And so that's going to increase the respiratory rate and ventilation. And then that can then be uh, connected with or um, concepts can be run parallel with the electron transport chain, which is upregulated to make more ATP now, which is also um, causes a, a byproduct of heat. And so increased heat production is um, the end result of that mechanism when we have metabolism upregulation due to actions of thyroid hormone. Um, the thyroid hormone are also responsible for breakdown or catabolic reactions and increase uh, lipoly- lipolysis and gluconeogenesis, which can lead to hyperglycemia, hence why you see some of these uh, symptoms in these patients when the regulation is not normal. Um, constipation can also result in thyroid hormone deficiency 
Uh, the autonomic nervous system stimulation um, is also regulated by the thyroid hormone. So T3, T4 stimulate beta-1 adrenergic receptors on the heart. And so this increases heart rate and contractility. Okay, and then a quick um, overview about uh, differentiating hyper and hypothyroidism. So, hy sorry about that typo there. Hyperthyroidism means high levels of thyroid hormone or high levels of T3, T4. So, primary hyperthyroidism is caused by excessive release of thyroid hormone from the thyroid gland. Uh, so, there's excessive stimulation of T3, T4 receptors. Um, uh, so, sorry, excessive stimulation of T3, T4 receptors in the peripheral tissues. So here uh, the issue is that the thyroid gland itself is overactive, and so it's increasing um, levels of T3, T4. And um, as a feedback mechanism, this will um, prevent that anterior pituitary from stimulating more TSH. Hence why we have a high T3, T4, but a low TSH. However, in secondary hyperthyroidism, this is caused by excessive release of TSH from the anterior pituitary. And so that causes excessive stimulation of the thyroid gland and excessive production of thyroid hormone. So again, high T3, high T4, but also high TSH since the issue at hand here is going to be the anterior pituitary. Hypothyroidism is going to be low levels of thyroid hormone. So in primary, it's caused by decreased function of the thyroid gland. Um, and so there is low T3, T4, but a high TSH since we have low levels, and that's going to uh, cause the normal function um, of our anterior pituitary and hypothalamus to cause an increase in more release of T3, T4. However, in secondary hypothyroidism, this is caused by decreased function of the anterior pituitary. So if we have decreased function, that means that um, our TSH is going to be low since the anterior pituitary is what regulates TSH. And as a result, the T3, T4 is also going to be low. Okay, so last question. A patient comes in with chronic fatigue thinning hair, and weight gain, a family history of Hashimoto's hypothyroidism. You suspect that this patient has primary hypothyroidism. If that is the case, what would be the levels of TSH, T3, T4, and RT3? So what would be the levels of T3? Low. Yep. And T4? Low. Mm -hmm. TSH? Mm-hmm. And then RT3? No. Exactly. RT3 and T4 are going to be synergistic or running sort of parallel. Exactly. And, oh, one more. A patient has low T4 and low TSH. Does this patient have primary or secondary hypothyroidism? Secondary. Exactly. Um, secondary because... It's an issue at the anterior pituitary, so TSH is not functional, and then hence we're also just going to have low T3, T4. And that's all I got, folks.